Welcome to Money Talks, a series of interviews with me, Liam Halligan, Economics and Business Editor of GB News. This episode features Gareth Stace, the CEO of UK Steel, the trade body for the British-based steel industry, which still employs over 30,000 people. For years, fierce international competition and high domestic costs have seen UK steel plants struggle to be competitive in a global market. Now the coronavirus pandemic and an increased focus on decarbonisation are bringing the government's strategy towards the steel sector into sharp focus. In 2019, the UK produced 7 million tonnes of steel, but China produced 142 times more. Energy costs, of course, are also key for steelmakers and manufacturers in general, who tend to be heavy energy users. And unlike for households, there's no energy price cap for UK firms. Good to see you, Gareth. The UK steel industry employs over 30,000 people in the UK still, uh, but we only produce 7 million tonnes a year in a normal year. They produce 40 million a year in Germany and over 950 million in China. Why is that? The headline news here would be that we don't have an industrial strategy in the UK. Um, Historically, governments of all shades of colour don't set um, a competitive business environment for foundation sectors like steel really to flourish. And you you see that in droves in Germany. They make sure that their energy prices, for example, are really competitive and much lower than ours. And and that's what we need here. You know, we're we're a, a small country that's just come out of the EU. We've got a chance to furrow our our own destiny here and have a vision. And that vision could be to have sectors like steel that produce materials like paper and glass and ceramics and, 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 and steel that go into a really strong and vibrant manufacturing sector. But we haven't had that. And we don't have any indication that this government wants to do that. We do see the Prime Minister talk about high wage economy and levelling up, and that really would involve steel, but we don't see any detail of that. And we need to before, I think it's too late, before you that seven million tonnes becomes six, becomes five, becomes four, and then we just see us as a sector withering on the vine. And this is the country where they, they invented how you make steel. How seriously has the steel industry been hit by the 200, 300, 400% rise we've seen in wholesale gas prices? You're obviously a very energy intensive sector. There's no cap for commercial users of gas and energy as there is for households. What's it doing to the companies that make up your membership? Completely and utterly turning it on its head. Uh, Some steel companies have said to me, we feel like we're actually becoming energy price risk managers, not steel makers, um, because the price is fluctuating so wildly. Uh, As you said, Liam, it's gone up so much, it's gone up 10 times since it was last year. But the crucial thing for us here, you know, if everyone was in the same boat, you know, sometimes ministers say, oh, this is a global problem. Um, And whilst it is a global problem, we feel it much more here in the UK. So for example, uh, last Thursday, we looked at spot prices and spot prices in, in the UK were three times higher than they were in Germany. But we are also seeing those real crazy, crazy spikes in electricity prices in weird times of the day, which means when our members, when the steel producers in the UK see these, they stop production. Now, you can stop production for a little bit here, a little bit there, a few times a week, and that's probably fine. But if you keep stopping production, you not only produce less steel, but you your environmental emissions go up, your carbon emissions go up, your, your kit that you're using to make that steel uh, breaks quickly because it's, it's, it's designed to be used at full pelt. And so it's not good news. Um, but you know, even on Friday night, Friday night when energy prices, electricity prices on that spot market should be low, they were above a thousand pounds a megawatt hour, which you know, if you think of at home, you'd be paying kilowatt hours, that's above one pound a kilowatt hour, which is just incredible. You'd be turning your TVs off if the price of electricity at home was was at that price. It's true to say though, isn't it, Gareth, that long before this current energy crisis, UK steelmakers have paid far more for their energy than other countries in the EU. Why is that? And indeed they have, you know, for over 10 years. We've been saying to government, 
And again, of all colours, not just this Conservative administration, we seem to be paying more for electricity. So five years ago, because they, the governments were not listening to us every year telling, telling them that, that, that this was making us uncompetitive, it was tying our hands behind our backs in terms of the ability to make steel and trade it on the global market, uh, we produced an annual report that we set out this price differential, this price disparity between us and Germany and France. We, it's always Germany and France we look at to, so we can see the, uh, the progression of this. Um, and why is it? Well, it's because of government policy. Government decides that someone's got to pay for transmission charges, uh, um, capacity charges, carbon charges, renewable charges, all of those charges, and they pile them onto very large energy users like the steel sector. So yes, that's why we see that massive difference uh, between us and Germany. In that report, we set out what that difference is, how uncompetitive it makes us, why those prices are so different, and crucially, crucially, we say to government, this is how you could change that, this is how you could solve it, and we set that out in quite some detail, because we wouldn't want government to say, well, it's just too difficult, because it isn't. Every solution that we come up with is the solution that's been tried and tested somewhere in Europe. It doesn't go against WTO rules or, or um, state aids, etc. They're all tried and tested methods. And every year we pass this publication to government and every year whoever's in the Department for Business or in Treasury at the time say, thank you very much. Yes, that's not very good, is it? Oh, it must be very difficult for you. We must look at this. And they do nothing. The last time anyone did anything on this was in 2016. The government's net zero agenda how is it impacting the steel industry? Is it making your members less competitive? Is it translating into higher energy prices? And a big part of your cost base is the price of energy, right? Oh, yeah, totally. So two, two things. One, if you think of the price of carbon, that's at its kind of highest level at the moment, so we're paying that. But I'd like to flip this around and say, net zero carbon, we're a highly carbon intensive sector, but we make steel. And when you think of a steel as a material, in a modern society such as the UK, everything is either made of steel or made using steel. When we move, as we move further to a net zero carbon world in the UK, this country will not be using less steel, it will be using more steel. All the government scenarios of how we're going to get to net zero carbon in 2040 or 2050 all use more steel. Therefore, what should we do? Should we? Because they're using wind turbines, they're using solar, they're using all kinds of renewables, all of which use lots of steel. Yeah, and, and really high-tech steel as well, you know, um, lightweight in for automobiles, etc. So exactly, Liam. And therefore, do, what do we do? Do we just import all that steel? Or does this government say, right, actually, to get to net zero carbon, do we take control of our own responsibilities in terms of the carbon emissions, and therefore do we make more steel in the UK? You'd said earlier, we produce 7 million tonnes of steel in the UK. We consume 13 million tonnes of steel. So there's so much more that we should be making rather than importing halfway across the world with all those carbon emissions and relinquishing our carbon responsibilities to somewhere else and we just kind of think, oh, it's not our problem. It is our problem and we should be making that steel here. So we already consume almost twice the amount of steel that we make. We consume 13, one, three million tonnes and we make only seven million tonnes. So how can the government change that outcome? How can the government help you and your members to produce more steel? It's really simple. Just give us a better competitive business environment to work in that we don't have at the moment. So I've talked about electricity and I hope we can talk about that more because that's our key issue at the moment. But even on business rates, the business rate system in the UK for um, capital intensive sector like steel is crazy. So I'm a steel producer. I could say I, I want to buy a new piece of kit that might cost me a hundred million pounds, say for example. When I do that, and buy it, and it makes me more efficient. I can employ more people because I'm better competing in the market. My business rate bill goes up. And it goes up every year, forever. Because they take into account all of the new, more efficient machinery that you're buying to replace the old stuff. And therefore, you're, you know, you're adding to the UK economy, but your business rate bill goes up. On procurement, the government is the biggest purchaser of steel in the UK. They buy a million tonnes a year. Do they buy it from the UK, or do they just 
buy it from somewhere. They just buy it from somewhere. If you ask them, these days they do know, but about four years ago, we, we asked government, Where, you know, do you buy it from the UK? Do you buy it elsewhere? No government department knew what proportion of the steel that they purchased in all the major projects, you know, infrastructure projects, etc., came from the UK. They know now, but it's still under 50%. Now, we're not saying buy British. What we're saying is don't just look at the price of steel or let the tier one or tier two contractors just go off and buy the steel from wherever. Think and just think about value. So it's value of where that steel's produced. Is it produced in the UK? How many people does it employ? Uh, are the carbon emissions lower? Are the transport emissions lower? Will it, will it employ even more people in the UK if we buy that steel from there? All of those things are not considered. And it should be. And then we would be purchasing more steel from the UK. And then more of that uh, million tonnes a year that the government buys, we could be producing for them. Hang on, uh, Gareth. I remember when Boris Johnson stood at the dispatch box in the House of Commons explaining to lots of backbenchers who didn't want HS2 to go ahead that HS2 was in fact going ahead. One of the sweeteners, he said, was, of course, we'll be buying... British steel would be by prioritising steel made here in the UK because, of course, Europe's biggest infrastructure project, a, a massive stonking great railway, uses lots of steel. Is that happening? In short, no. And I'll tell you why. Because they have uh, procurement guidelines. There is government procurement guidelines. And HS2 could follow every single one and tick all the boxes and still buy 0% of steel from the UK. It won't. You know, all the track... Presumably, like 97% of the track it'll buy from the UK, but the, the bridges, the gantries, the stations. I hope that they engage with steel producers in the UK, uh, but it's more of a hope than knowing they will. That's, that's the key issue. It's, it's letting us know as a sector, in five years' time, we will need this amount of steel. It needs to be this grade. It needs to be delivered there. If we have that sort of information, then steel companies in the UK, whether they're big or they're, or they're much smaller, can plan for that, can work with those contractors or work with those big projects and then deliver that, that steel and that value to those projects. Let's go back to the electricity price. Are you saying that the government should cap the electricity price for commercial users as it caps the electricity price for domestic users? So ideally, yes, um, but... I think there's a, there's a massive cost to that. So let's be, you know, let's be reasonable and pragmatic here. When we look at the wholesale prices, that's what's killing us at the moment. Because those wholesale prices, you'd think wholesale price, hmm, they'd be the same in Germany as they are in the UK. No, they're not. That's what I was saying in terms of they are three times uh, in the UK than they are in Germany. So what we're looking for is the government temporarily, I hope temporarily, just to soften that blow, bring us down to what, are, what basically are our direct competitors in France, Germany, Spain, and let's say Turkey. I mean, they're a big competitor, but I think their prices are even less for energy. And, and give us that, that boost now, because if this crazy prices, if they continue, which, when I'm speaking to um, a member steel company today, tell me that even into quarter one, those forward prices are about the same as we're seeing now. So it's not going to go anytime soon when we do hear government ministers saying, don't you worry, by the new year, it'll all be fine. That's not what the markets are saying. No. We can see forward markets. You, you can buy now, as in any sophisticated financial market, you can buy now for delivery in the future. You're saying that prices for delivery in January are pretty much where they are today or certainly elevated compared to normality. Yeah, they're broadly the same, yeah. And wow. next summer, they come down a bit, next summer. Um, so if things continue, government doesn't help. Government doesn't bridge that gap between us and our continental European competitors. Then it's going to become more and more unsustainable to make steel in the UK. And you know, at some point, and I couldn't say when, and I don't want to be crying wolf. The government always accuses us of crying wolf. I don't want to cry wolf, but I, was, I, I think I know um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out. If you're uncompetitive, that you're pause in production, that you're losing market share, uh, that um, you're coming out of certain products because they're either highly electro-intensive or they're less um, value-added, so to speak. If you're doing all of that, when a business is unsustainable, it is unsustainable you don't carry on and i think i'm right in saying gareth that for steelmakers energy is generally between a fifth and a quarter of their costs right it's a big junk yeah in normal times yeah so now yeah what is it so for an electric arc furnace producer where they take scrap steel they stick it in a massive 
bucket that's the size of a house and they stick two electrodes in it and that uses half as much electricity as a, as a city like Cardiff, literally that much. Electricity prices as they are now uh, doubling, they're yeah. doubling the, uh, um, the cost of you making steel. So you just price out of the market. That's the problem. You know, you, you talked about we use a lot of energy. We use as much gas as 400,000 homes. We use as much electricity as 850,000 homes. It's a huge amount. So any time the, the energy prices change for us, it's a, it's a massive impact. Over half the steel in the world now is made in China. China makes 142 times more steel than we do. Is that a problem? Yes, it can be a massive problem. It's almost like that when China sneezes, we catch a cold. So China at the moment, its economy is running OK. So all of that steel that it's making, as you said, over half the world's steel, it's using itself. It's also actually importing more steel at the moment. But all you need is just a few you know, 0.1% of its economy to go down a bit, and suddenly they've got a surplus of, well, I remember in 2015, 2016, it had a surplus of 100 million tonnes of steel and it exported it. That hits world markets, prices collapse, high cost steel makers like hit us in the UK, we get mullered by that, right? Totally and utterly, because it doesn't matter what it sells it for and it can flood, and steel travels across the world quickly. Um, and actually 43% or 40% of all steel produced travels across borders. We are a truly global market in steel. The price is set globally. You can lose a deal on five pounds a tonne of steel. So when we're talking about the energy prices we just said, therefore we're just lo we can lose orders at the moment, left, right and centre. And as I said, you know, Turkey come into our market within a matter of weeks. Uh, and it's easy to come into a market because you have steel grades and therefore, you know, traders, importers can just come straight in here and, and we can be substituted. And it's easy to lose market share. Very, very difficult to get it back. Gareth, what does Brexit potentially allow the British government to do for your industry in terms of regional assistance, in terms of free ports, in terms of state aid? The landscape's changed, hasn't it? Is the government making use of these post-Brexit freedoms in order to support the steel industry, in your view, adequately? We're not seeing it yet. You know, I'm hugely encouraged by the Prime Minister in his conference speech only a few weeks ago uh, saying that he wants to level up and he wants a high-wage economy. And I, and I wish I was in the audience. I would have stood up and said, well, you've, you've got it. We're the steel sector. That's exactly what yeah. we do. Most of the 31,000 people we employ in the UK are employed in those levelling up areas. And they get pretty decent wages. And they get it's, very it's decent skilled wages. Work. It's highly skilled. It's well paid. They, they get paid 45% more in those regions than the average salary uh, in those regions. And therefore, win-win. It's the steel sector. If you want that levelling up high wage economy, go for the steel sector. Uh, and therefore, out of the EU, we're not constrained by EU rules. We're not constrained by state aid rules so much. And we can have a government that if it wants to do something, it can do it. And that's why I tell them with um, electricity prices or even business rates, you can do all these things. We have the solutions for you. We, 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 we can work with you. It's the same with net zero. We have an ambition in the steel sector to continue that that journey to net zero carbon. We want to, by 2035, um, be 80% reduction by 2045, 2050, zero. But we can't do it without government because, because we need government to change policy. We need government to work with us in terms of, for example, if we're zero carbon and our steel in the UK costs however much more, and it's uncompetitive because you can bring high carbon steel in, for example, what we need the government to do is say, by this date, you can no longer purchase steel in the UK unless it's zero carbon. Yeah. We can get on with that journey and work with government to deliver in its vision and our vision and the trade union's vision. What would you say if I told you that my sources say that you're not going to get much help from the Treasury at all, not in this budget, not afterwards? I think it would be hugely disappointing. I think it would be short-sighted. It's, you've got the sectors here, the foundation sectors, but you know, from my point of view, the steel sector, a really important sector. Uh, there's so much more we could go for, that we consume so much more steel than we make in the UK. 
Uh, and therefore, this is your chance. This is your real chance after Brexit to change this economy to back sectors like steel that feed directly into really important manufacturing sectors like automotive, aerospace, well, defence even, but construction and transport, other transport. So not to help us means that uh, this isn't a free market. The steel sector would love a free market. The problem that we have is that we have so much government, uh, not so much red tape, but there is that, but government policy that makes it uncompetitive to make steel in the UK. And if it continues to do that, then drip, 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 death by a thousand cuts, we will lose the steel sector. Not overnight, but just little bits here and there, and suddenly it'll be gone. And the crucial thing about the steel sector is that it's so capital intensive that if a steel plant closes, and there's only six steel producers in the UK, if they close, sorry, they don't open ever again, they close. So what do you say to the Chancellor before the budget? I say, think about it. Think about that the, that the Prime Minister's vision is levelling up high-wage economy. We do that. Think about the 31,000 people that are employed in our sector, their families, their local communities, you know, what they do for that wider economy. This isn't a political game. This is real people's lives and livelihoods here. Uh, and that's what we need to think about. And that's why we need a competitive, vibrant, expanding uh, steel sector with a really good long-term vision going forward, not letting it flounder and die uh, wither on the vine now because there's, no, there's not this short-term intervention just to help us for the next few months on electricity prices and ensuring that we have that competitive business environment here in the UK. How about if, for now, temporarily, the government lifted the renewable surcharges and levies that come through in the energy price that your members are desperately trying to cope with? Yeah, and that would be great. Thank you very much. They're not going to do it before COP26, though, right? Because they'll get bad headlines from environmental campaigners. Because what we're asking for is not just ignore that, let us um, chuck out all the missions we want. We're saying temporarily to keep us going. Because the flip side, as I was saying, the flip side would be, let's just import all the steel from wherever in the world. Now, we... Um, and it'll be carbon intensive still, won't it? It'll be much more carbon intensive, likely more carbon intensive. But remember, it's on a boat with the carbon emissions of that boat and those transport emissions for steel are, are really quite high up as a proportion of the embedded carbon within that steel. Why would you do that when you can make it here in the UK, you can transport it on rail, uh, that our steel plants can work with the manufacturers, you've got that supply chain. We all understand that a good, strong supply chain you know, is a real positive for the economy to chop off the supply chain right at the beginning in a foundation set to like steel. I'm not an economist, but I, I surely know that, that that surely is not the right thing to have a strong and vibrant manufacturing sector in the UK. But it's hard to help steel companies indiscriminately, isn't it? I mean, some of them, the steel companies in this country, they're, you know, extremely wealthy Chinese companies or they're extremely wealthy families of Indian oligarchs with respect. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because the ownership of the British steel sector is so varied. Yeah. Out of the six steel companies, six steel producers in the UK, only one of them is actually parent companies based in the UK. So you need to give the excuse to these parent companies that if they've got a million pounds to invest, that they invest it here in the UK, not in Spain or Germany or India or, or China. If you could get better returns elsewhere, you'd make that investment elsewhere. Why would you make it here? Final question, Gareth. What could the British steel industry look like in, in 10 years' time? It currently employs about 30,000 people. Uh, we're currently making 7 million tonnes a year. What could it be, given our steel-making heritage, given the fact that we still have lots and lots of highly skilled people with a lot of experience in the steel-making industry? So from my point of view, we could have a, a vibrant steel sector that's much bigger than it is now, that's supplying all the steel that the UK needs, that it would be zero carbon, that we'd be the first country in the, in the world that has a fully zero carbon steel sector. That's what we need, that we could be exporting that steel across the world as well. But we can only do that with the support of this government and all future governments. And it could happen. Gareth Stace, thanks a lot for joining me. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot for listening to Money Talks with me, Liam Halligan, Economics and Business Editor of GB News. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube or wherever you're listening. Do subscribe to this podcast and also check out my daily television show, On The Money. 1pm Monday to Friday on GB News or via the GB News app. GB News, Britain's news channel.